Sorry, takes a second here. And then we go back to sharing. <laughs> and I'll just do a quick intro and then I'm going to hand it off back to Terry. So Terry's going to talk to us tonight about Neophonetias. Um, and I think uh, a fair number of people know him, but for those who don't, uh, he is in uh, Toronto and um, has uh, long-term connections with the folks here in California in the Bay Area. Um, Background-wise, he is uh, not only a landscaper uh, with an interest in miniature orchids and other peculiar plants from around the world. He runs a boutique plant business in Toronto called Flora Peculia, and it's linked here, and we put it in the, again, on the website and in the newsletter. <laughs> also a music grad um, from the University of Toronto um, in orchestral, orchestral conducting, uh, and uh, has been growing plants since the age of six, uh, is, is um, very focused on Japanese orchids, and, and um, He'll be talking to us tonight about uh, Neos. I heard him and met him really at the 22nd uh, World Orchid Conference in Ecuador in 2017. And we made the connection there and have been planning to invite him as a speaker since then and just now kind of manage. We want to do it in person, but I'm glad we could uh, make this happen. So Terry, thank you. And um, we look forward to hearing your talk. So I'm going to stop sharing and let you share and you should be able to do it the same way as before. So let's, there okay, it goes. Tell me to make it a full screen. It looks, I think it's, oh yeah. Uh, I think the lower right corner, there's like a little icon, a little over to the left in the middle of that bottom area. It looks like a little there's like a slide bar with minus to plus, and just to the left of that, there's like a little one over to the right. This one? Not right. Yep. <laughs> Try that. Yay. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We, I, I met Jeff in person a while ago. I spoke in Nevada and in some societies in California. I like to say it's good to be back. Uh, it's kind of weird being on Zoom, but um, I'm looking forward to coming to California again. I had a really good time, um, the times I was there. Um, I'm gonna skip over my introductions as Jeff did a good job, except I'm gonna brag that I conducted Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 9, so there. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> That's a must tell. Um, and I spoke in Ecuador and I'm a, but what, I, what I'm gonna talk about is, um, I, I noticed your, people, people come in all um, levels. And I'm, I'm gonna introduce Neo-Phoenicia from the aspect of Japan and how it fits into the whole subculture of growing Japanese. Uh, orchids. And so we're going to look a little bit about Japan and uh, take it from there. Um, I fell in love with Japan around 2003. I, I went for a day and a half. Why a day and a half? Because there was an orchid show in February and I had a free ticket. And that was the terms of the trip. And I found it very fascinating. And the whole tie-in, which I'm going to bring into Japanese orchids and neo Phoenicias and judging, I'm, 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 not a, I'm not a judge, but I'm gonna look at uh, a Japanese orchids from my own point of view, um, because that's the way I like to, I have a very personal taste in growing and appreciating plants in general. And the first thing I noticed about Japan is the aesthetic, and it wasn't about flowers necessarily. It's about the way things are laid out, uh, the kind of pots they use, uh, mosses and rocks, and no, no blooms to be seen. And I remember um, going to a small pottery town near Kyoto. We rented a car and just lovely landscapes created out of moss in little uh, backyard bowls that were for sale. And this is one of the most striking things I saw in Tokyo. If you've ever been to Tokyo, people grow plants by the side of their houses in these tiny, tiny streets. And this was a drip, drip, 
drip faucet and the, the, the owners were just growing moss um, in this little water garden that they created. So that, um, I, I, that's one reason I fell in love with Japan. And then Tokyo Dome, you, you're in California, you're only a couple of hours closer to than Toronto, believe it or not, but it's worth the, the flight to Tokyo when things settle down. It is an immense show. Um, there used to be half a million people attending and now the show is orchids and plants. So they've kind of expanded. So I'm just gonna take you on a, a short tour through the Tokyo show. And um, I, I find in Japan, I don't know if people are more, um, they have more time on their hands, but um, there's a lot of interesting things to be seen. Somebody stenciled hundreds and hundreds of Phalaenopsis um, flowers in this particular showcase. And there's a lot of interesting and um, specimen plants to be seen. Plants I've never heard of, like this Australian um, uh, orchid. And I found that although they, they're really into Western things, everything Western was assimilated into their own way of looking at it. Um, now back to the show. This is um, a first prize winner and this Solagena is a meter in diameter in all directions. Just to give you a scope of what wins in this show. At the same time, a single flower Kovakii won in 2013. You can spend thousands of dollars on rare plants that are hidden in cages. Um, this particular champion uh, was carried half the year in the mountains, half the year in the lowlands in order to bloom and win. And the prize for something like that is a red Mercedes and $25,000 in cash, like the San Francisco Society, I'm told, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, this, right. this was actually the winner in uh, this year. Uh, there was a show, it was uh, the vendor list was cut down a lot and it's just, I'm not gonna say just, but it is a high um, And as I say, you can spend $3,000 on a miniature plant, you can spend $4,000 on a path, you can also spend 60 bucks on a bunch of grapes. Um, there's just so many interesting things to see. Uh, when you're going through all the different stores in Tokyo or parts of Japan. And then at some point I discovered this in 2003, it meant nothing to me. It's a Neophonesia. I just kind of looked at it and pretended I knew what it was, but I didn't. And so we're gonna just go into traditional Japanese um, gardening. And what, what I found in looking at Japanese plants there's, there's, there's a correlation, but some of the main ones are Dendrobium monoliforme, Cymbidium garingii, Sidereas, Calanthe, Omoto, and Bonsais. And there's two things that really stood out was the mutations and the presentations. Uh, this I think is an Omoto. And there's a subculture, I would say, in, in all these plants. And what I found was particularly in Dendrobium monoliforme, um, Cymbidium garingii and Neophonesia falcata. Um, there's, there's a correlation, I, I'm gonna call it, uh, almost like three different societies or subcultures in growing in Japanese uh, orchids. Um, okay, and in terms of um, appreciation and we'll, we'll get into the judging, the, the presentation is so important. And there's a Kokodama style, which is growing things in moss, which was so striking. You can even buy these things in department stores and you can grow a whole uh, host of plants in this kind of style. And it's, it ties into the presentation and how plants are judged and the orchids will look at. Uh, just, just so you know, there's something called Omoto, which is Rodeo Japonica. And like the other uh, Japanese orchids, they come in a whole slew of varieties and variegations and uh, there's probably a society for them too. And they're really fascinating. I've, I've never seen them in Canada. There's a couple of growers in the West, I'm sure. Um, so I'm gonna look at um, the, the, those three types and the third one will be Neophonesia. 
So I found um, in Japan, there's a society just for Dendromium monoliforme, and they call it Sekoku. And the plant here on the bottom is what the wild form would look like. And it grows from the northern parts all the way down to Okinawa into the southern parts. And uh, like Neophanesia, when a Dendromium monoliforme is chosen as a variety, you can see they, they're given the name Chosiden, and like Neophanesia, they get a they, they they're judged. They're given a name. They're given an official variety, and the I'm I'm, I'm almost tempted to to start getting into the and I am in, in many ways I'm starting to collect them because some of the forms are just so fascinating. Um, you see how it's moved from the regular form to these little. Uh, round leaves and the highly striped leaves on the right, and um, each one is given a Japanese name. Um, this is a picture of an uh, outstanding specimen in the Tokyo Dome show called Genkiko. And this is uh, a, a highly colored leaf variety. And then this one really caught my eye because of the whiteness of both the stem and the petals. And a lot of times there is no leaves at all sometimes and you just get a lot of flowers growing. And here's a flower variety, Sekiho. And then the thing about them is, you know, you can buy one, it looks kind of not so nice, but eventually they do grow leaves and then become, it becomes like a little forest with little flowers. And that's the best way I can describe them. Um, I saw, I went to a little nursery in, outside Kyoto in a tiny town and there was a log just covered in them and it looked like a little forest and just the the varieties and the variegation and the miniatureness of some of them is just really fascinating to me and like other orchids um, they have shows and presentations without flowers um, um, another one i'm just going to briefly mention that that's highly mutated in in and is Sipponica. Uh, and uh, some of these varieties are available in Maru, Marushima. There are other varieties, but I find they're unstable and they uh, often revert to wild type, but these, these are good varieties to own. Um, I just want to show, oh, and there was one interesting one that um, I managed to pick up. It was shipped to me from Japan during a heat wave. It's about the size of a dime. There were only two in the world. I had one, but the heat wave was so bad it died on the way. <laughs> so, um, but just the just the 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 difference in mutation. It's they they call it Gensu Nogaran, which means basically knuckle, uh, a knuckle scenario. And then finally, um, there is, I want to touch upon cymbidiums. This is what we mostly know about cymbidiums. I know cymbidiums are big in California. But Japanese Cymbidium garingii, it's slowly, there's discussions online, but um, there's a lot of misinformation I'm going to say. I only know one person who successfully grows them and blooms them uh, on a regular and has, and has created a protocol for them. <coughs> you might be able to share. Um, these are very difficult to bloom and to bloom correctly. If you don't do it correctly, a flower like this will turn green, it'll die or it'll blast. Um, but it is such an amazing um, variety of mutations in this Gringii. And in, in Chinese culture, all those grassy things you see on um, the water paintings are actually Japanese, are actually uh, Cymbidium gringii, not necessarily Japanese, but Chinese as well. And the ones you buy uh, when international vendors come to the US or Canada, they're mostly these gringii right here. They're not Cymbidium gringii variety gringii, um, which are come from Korea, Japan, and Shanghai only. It's a very different um, ball game, these compared to these. Um, and again, like all the Japanese or because we're going to talk about all the mutations, flower colors, stripes of all short of all sorts, 
and flower and leaf mutations and the size of the plant itself. So we'll just look at a couple of um, interesting things, uh, Cymbidium grinchii. And just to be aware of uh, some of the flower forms, they come in classic red with long petals and everything that's important here, like the neophnesos we're gonna look at, uh, the roundness of the petals versus the angularity. This is a very um, popular one that's coming out of Japan right now called Mabina. And then Hakuden is a white flower. And my favorites are when you have red, green, and white together. Uh, that one's called Shinpi. Just a couple more to look at. Again, green and orange together. And then Beni Usagi is a red flower and it has extra floral parts. So the, the mutations and combinations are almost endless. And here's a couple more flower forms just to introduce you if you're, if you're not familiar with them. This one's really cool, Polaric form, uh, Kangama Jishi, and Shomai, a butterfly form. And then striping. Um, striping is very interesting. It all depends on the season and you cannot culturally create striping. It is part of the genetic of the plant in the case of snakeskin striping. And um, this one on the left, which is also a snakeskin variety called Simonia. And you look at a nicely grown plant, it'll look like something like that. And it'll change through the seasons. And you're not a bad grower if it starts turning green. Um, but it's the, the curliness and the shortness is something that really um, gets my attention. And then there are tiger stripes. And you can see the differences between these, these two. Um, this is a wider leaf, that's a thinner leaf, Akigayama, and, the, and these are readily available from Japan. Um, and then my favorite of all Japanese orchids, doesn't matter what species or varieties, are the little bean varieties. These are tiny, tiny, two, three inch uh, full grown plants. Um, they're called mameba or bean varieties. And then if you know the little Martian guy, it also comes in little flowers like that on tiny plants and it's just something totally different if you're used to growing regular cymbidiums, a four inch tall plant with little two and a half inch tall flowers. Uh, so the combinations are endless and we can dream on of what's coming out. And these are very expensive, by the way, this is not for the faint of heart to purchase these kind of plants. Um, this slide is just for fun. This is a Chinese variety and it goes for about 3 million Canadian, which is about $3 US. And there's another Korean variety right here. And the appreciation of these things, it, this is not a messy plant. And even when we look at Neil's, the, the, the curves in the leaves and the thinness of the leaves, every aspect is what's going to be judged when we move on to Neophonesias. And when we, when we look at these plants as well, this one has a rounder leaves and totally different flowers. And look at the corkscrew stems, which is absolutely stunning. And about 150,000 Canadian for three growths. It's $50,000 a growth, how's that? And the thing about growing these, if you ever wanna try it, you have to use the Japanese Cymbidium mix. I've seen, I don't get involved in online discussions, but I've seen arguments. <laughs> um, if you don't want your plant to decline, uh, you're going to have to get your hands on this. And I've, I, I, I want to ask you guys, um, nobody sells this stuff, but I found out from someone in Japan that somebody in San Francisco, a nursery, has made a huge order of these things. And I'd like, if somebody knows who it is, please let me know, contact me. Um, because I, I need to, I'm running out of this, this. I used to bring it myself when I was uh, in Tokyo. So somewhere in San Francisco is a large supply of this. And the thing about these things is they, they're not cold growers. And the thing about when you, when, you, when you see always online, oh, it's a cold grower. The bud is developed earlier in the season, but vernalization takes place in the winter time. Vernalization means the cold temperatures for the bud 
to actually work that was already set. It's not the cold that set the plant. Um, so there are, it, we can grow them in Toronto. I know there's a guy in Italy that's able to bloom them. I'm not sure um, if you can have the conditions where you are, but good luck. And then Korean green jay is a whole different topic and we're not gonna get into that. But the meat of the conversation is something that caught my eye. And I'm gonna do a personal journey through Neophenicia falcata, which in my mind is, is the perfect orchid because it's appreciated for every single aspect of the plant. This is a plant called Fukiden, which we'll come back to later. Um, for the beginner, Neophonesia grows on trees. This is somebody's persimmon tree um, in Japan. And it's called the wind orchid because they flutter in, in, in the wind and the, the fragrance is just absolutely intoxicating. In fact, there was a study done and 90 compounds were isolated on Neophonesia uh, more than any other uh, orchid so far that was studied for, for fragrance. Um, to appreciate the Neophonesia, um, you literally look at every aspect of it, and hopefully by the end of the talk, uh, you'll see how you can judge or understand this plant. Root tips are important, the roots themselves, the stem, where the stem meets the leaf. Um, it sounds boring, but it's not. Uh, let's just see um, where we are now. We're in Japan. And... Um, so just below where the earthquake was is the Neophonesia region. It grows on the snows all the way down to the subtropic um, areas of Japan, including Okinawa, and also in uh, uh, southeastern China and Korea. Um, the history, I'm just going to briefly say, uh, we, we, there's no one history about Neophonesia from about six, the, the, the Edo era. The Edo means um, Tokyo when the capital of Japan was moved to Tokyo and it was called Edo uh, from about 1603 to 1868. And that's the period, that's the last of traditional Japan. Uh, what, what we think about historically and all the, uh, the movies we see about traditional Japan, that's the Edo era. And during that time, it was a very peaceful time and people collected for their, for their lords um, basically mutations in the wild. So you go and find a tree full of Neophonesia and you find something like that, you pull it and create this interesting variety and a new variety was born. And it is said that such a variety would have cost the price of a house in, in the Edo era in feudal Japan. And here is a picture from the Edo era and it's very interesting because people often call me and say, my moss is green, what should I do? Should I repot it? And this artist actually drew the algae on the moss, which I found very interesting. So um, that's an old, old picture. I was in Tokyo at a very interesting bookstore and I asked, do you have any books with Neil Phoenicia? And he kind of thought, it was a very fascinating story, just full of, full of old books. And then he pulls one out and there's a reference to one with a drawing. And I said, can I take a picture? He goes, no. And I said, how much for the book? He goes, $4,000. <laughs> it was a book from 1760, I think from 1763. So I got a chance to see a little bit of Neophonesia history. Um, so they would be highly regarded. And um, the one you see in the tree, and this is a mutation of it, <laughs> created high respect. And this is uh, an emperor's net that was put around it. And then um, after the Edo era, the Japanese started collecting Cattleya. They discovered Cattleya's Western orchids, which were also expensive. And then uh, around 1927 is the second Neophonesia boom when businessmen were able to afford them. And then by 1970, there was a show in um, Osaka, I believe, and then a book was published and they became readily available uh, to the general public. For those that are new to Neophonesia, the picture you saw in the tree um, can mutate into all these things and more over, there's probably about 2,500, 3,000 uh, varieties of this species. 
it's, it's not 2300 species, it's one species, like 7 billion humans is not 7 billion different species. I sometimes I wonder, but that's the way it is. And so it's a really fascinating plant if you're not familiar with it. Um, so we're just going to briefly look. Um, there's four main things to identify a variety and to appreciate it. Like we said before, the root, the stem, the leaf, and the flower. And you think, you know, I, I, I had to have a Japanese, I had an older gentleman, he was a old uh, merchant banker, retired, and he, he helped me communicate to Japan when I was first collecting them. And he goes, Teddy, you guys are crazy. You even appreciate, he did his own research, you even appreciate the roots. So the roots come in different colors and you go, well, what's the big deal? Well, if you have a green plant and then one day this happens, you know, that's fantastic. And people uh, have commented on my sales table. Oh, look, it's blooming. I go, no, it's the roots. So this one's called Hakucho, inexpensive variety, but really beautiful. And when you start getting into ruby roots, I don't know of any other plants that has ruby roots. Um, the price goes up, so you can spend a lot of money on that. You can also spend $300 on some mushrooms in Tokyo. Um, so. uh, appreciate the stem. So the stem, uh, I often, now and then I get a call, I sold somebody a plant, they send me a picture, what's wrong with it? Nothing. Um, there's so many aspects to the plant that you have to get to know them. And sometimes the stems are muddy brown, sometimes they're green, sometimes they look like they're virus, but they're not, that's just part of the character. And sometimes there's some beautiful varieties with totally brown stems. And then uh, where the leaves meet the, um, the plant here, it's called a tsuke. And that's another way of identifying it. And this one is mountain shaped. It's a little bit more rare. That's a straight line and so on. Um, and then leaf mutations are all over the map. Uh, there's so many new varieties coming out right now. Uh, contorted leaves, straight leaves, needle leaves. Um, bean leaves are absolutely my favorite. We'll mention bean leaves uh, right now. Hariba, uh, Serujishi. Let's look at a few varieties just so you get a sense. And Serujishi. You know, I, I don't care if it, that's part of the aesthetic is the way it's presented and uh, the way this plant would be judged. You can have a small piece of it messy on a, in a regular pot and it doesn't have much of an impact, but this plant is a perfect ball. It's like a pin cushion. It would take quite a few years to grow this way. And it's just um, the way it's presented and the pot that is put in makes a difference. It's not an expensive variety. It's, it's um, fairly readily available. One of the most famous ones, bean varieties, is Tamakongo. And these, they're like beans because they're really hard. They're like succulents. Um, if you touch the, the leaves, um, it's, really, it's really got a hard texture to it. So this is a classic bean that's created a lot of um, new varieties and has also mutated into some interesting things. It's called Tamakongo. This whole plant, Kuroshinju, is one of the first things I ever bought. This isn't mine. You notice there's, um, you notice there's no growing media in this plant. It's probably the size of a dollar coin, maybe a 50 cent piece. This is a very miniature, 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 and it's full size. I learned how to grow Neophonesia. I bought one in Michigan. It has six growths, one, two, three, four, five, six. It cost me $150 and I killed it in six months and I realized that I overwatered it. And the main killer of uh, almost all the comments I get for help is too much water, too much love. And the flower of Kuro Shinju is very different. It's small and round with no, I don't think it has a tail. It has a little bit of a pink and a little bit of green sometimes. Other types of flower mutations, very famous one called Sekai and Jukai. They're all from the same uh, parentage, but you see how they uh, mutated differently. And then Jukai, again, this is probably an inch and a half across, maybe two inches tops, and it's almost hard as nails. It's a really beautiful plant to enjoy all year. Not just, it's just, it's just the presentation of it. it. It's just really beautiful. And you're going to say, yeah, to you, you like, uh, I want flowers. And that's fine. But yeah, to me, <laughs> the, 
the weirder the better. And then where does this all go? Like, where do we get all these? Um, it, it, it's almost going to be endless from now on. So these are, this is the Kuro Shinjo I showed you up there. This is the Seikai. Now somebody took a small bean called Hijiri, which I couldn't find a picture of, and crossed it with Tamakongo, the one we showed earlier. And they ended up with this tiny, tiny plant. These are, it's about the size of a quarter, very similar to Kuro Shinju. And then they crossed it with another one and they got almost identical to Seikai and they called it Hijiri Seikai and Hijiri Naruma. And I've, these are, these are both my plants and I'm, I'm told the flowers should be the same, but I'm, they might be different. So it's very interesting to me uh, what it's gonna look like. And again, very succulent, hard plants. Um, other things to appreciate is the texture. Sometimes they're rough. I've had plants return to me saying this plant is sick. I go, no, it's not. Uh, ridged leaves are really nice. Um, and this is the rough leaf one called Kinkin Rasha. Rasha is a type of fabric uh, in Japan. Um, and this whole plant is maybe four, four and a half inches from left to right with beautiful uh, silky flowers. Uh, and an incredible fragrance. Um, Kujakumaru. Uh, some of them are really interesting because uh, this is a type of plant if you give it a lot of light. Again, this is about the size, maybe an inch and a half from here to here. You can see by the size of the moss. And if you give this plant a lot of light, this happens. If you don't give it a lot of light, it gets gangly like the regular meal. So just, and you see these things, don't worry about it. It's part of the plant. I've seen $20,000 plants with little, you know, even little nicks because these plants can get old and you can have them for a long time. It's almost like an heirloom. Uh, striping is very simple. It's either yellow or white. Um, and it can be random all over the place. Um, some of the, my favorite ones are the striped varieties with where the green, different, different varieties of stripes, half and half or more green or totally green. And that's Usumi Nishiki. Uh, this is Kinko Nishiki. It's one of the top 10 uh, on the chart in Japan. It's got very thick fleshy leaves and very colorful variegation. Um, a good one to own, not crazy expensive, even though it's one of the top 10. And um, th this is Orihime. And I'm going to say something which some people won't like. I hate Mary clones. <laughs> this is Orihime. They're both Orihime. I want my plant to be distinct from my neighbors. I want to see how I can grow it or what kind of, you know, especially if, 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 the, if they're grown from flask. Um, just the, the, the differences that, that can occur. Um, and culturally, it'll make a bit of a difference as, as well. So I don't want all the ODMAs to look like this or like this. Um, Merit Clones has its place, but to me, not for neo Um So that's the nice thing. It's like owning a pet rock. Your, your, your plant is gonna be different from your neighbors. Uh, this was a plant I sold to a friend. And again, presentation, uh, this was put into a modern pot. Sorry, not a friend, a customer. And um, he sent me this picture. And it's, it's Arayino Hikari. It's, it's not an expensive variety, but it's, it's one of my top favorite varieties because of the, the way the green and the yellow uh, stands out against each other. Uh, Fukurin means marginal variegation, and again, yellow or white. So the variegation is just on the margins, very simple. And these are two, this is a very common one, very easy to grow. And this is a wide leaf variety. Every, people say, oh, they look the same. If you look closely, they're not the same. This one has really thick, substantial leaves with a more defined green. And this one is, um, just what it is, the way you see it. It's, uh, it's very evenly distributed variegation. Uh, Tenke Fukurin is a famous one. Uh, one sold for $300,000. And I'm wondering if this is the one because it's the best picture I could find. And again, 
if you look at this is 10k focal in for about 140 dollars <laughs> right this if, if this runs you into the tens of thousands of dollars so what is the difference and what what, what are you being judged on here it's the presentation this plant was not I guarantee you was not just grown and grown and grown and grown. It's been called, babies were taken out. It's been shaped. It's been growing um, to look the way, it's, the way it's looking. If you just grow it, um, sorry. If you just grow it, it's gonna look like that. And it might take a while to look better. You can take barbecue skewers, you can straighten the leaves. You can do all kinds of things just to make to make each Neophoenicia almost look like a little colony of a, of a different sort. I think that's the best word for me. It looks like little colonies. And the story is, I, I talked to someone who knew this. The guy threw in the pot for $7,000 because the next thing about presentation and judging is the way you're growing the pot. Um, and believe it or not, the, when you choose your pot, you're gonna change the aura of this plant. Um, you, you just gotta take me on my word. These plants have an aura that changes with the pot you choose for it. I'm, I'm almost making this plant spiritual, ain't I? Uh, ben Yogi is red stripes, which is very beautiful. Everybody loves that. Um, and then there's tiger stripes, basically yellow or white. So there's vertical stripe. Uh, beans with with, with striping are extremely expensive, except for Kinko Jaku. Um, you can take any variety of bean and you can probably find, uh, I'll, I'll show you some pictures later and you start getting into the thousands of dollars. Kyokusho is a very um, famous one, a beautifully highly priced, we're talking like a couple hundred dollars. And then there's candy. <laughs> this is like a candy cane. You have tiger stripes that are pink and white, yellow against the green. This is called Hokage, very popular uh, and one of my favorites. And then who cares about the flowers? I, you know, I, to me, it's the whole presentation of the plant. There are shows in Japan that are just flowers for the flowers. And there are shows where there's not a single flower because the plants bloom in June anyway. And if you're going to spend um, $200 on a plant that has exactly the same flowers as a $30 plant, then you have to be the type of person that appreciates the plant, right? Um, these are some classic uh, red varieties. Uh, Togen was the very first uh, pink that was discovered. Before that, there was, we're, we're kind of used to a lot of flower varieties now, but there were no flower varieties. Uh, it was all white, 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 white. Ariquamaru is a bit expensive, but totally worth it in one of the best pinks there is. Green appeared about 20, 25 years ago for $20,000. Now they're about $20, $30. Uh, this is one of the best greens called Hisui. Uh, Zuiyun is a cream colored one. Yellow doesn't really exist. If it's yellow, then it's got Escocentrum. But even though it has, um, a hybrid in its background doesn't mean it's going to be cheap. Um, some of the nicest uh, hybrids with the, the you, you're like, like I, that's why, like I said, your plant is going to be different from your neighbors. And if you have a really good specimen, it can, it can go into the hundreds of dollars. Uh, unlike, you know, uh, other types of orchids that are mass produced hybrids, right? So Ongonmaro is one of those that will cost you a little bit. Manjushage is really available now. It's got three spurs, one, two, three. Almost all neos have uh, one spur. Uh, Shonkyuden is a uh, pyloric is, with, with touches of pink and touches of green, very pretty. And if you wanna, if you're a beginner and you want an interesting flower, this is a very strong plant to grow. It'll, it'll do, probably do well for you. Um, Nangokunamai has no, I, I found no way of pollinating it. I bloomed one, my friend bloomed one, we called each other, what do we do? So I think it's by division only and it's a staircase and uh, I'm not sure there is any pollinia on it. And everything is, is beautiful about this plant. Look at this, like a little, 
pitchfork coming out of the plant before it blooms. And then appreciation of them here, like I mentioned, um, when I started doing this, I got well, the first couple of shows I went to, I was really nervous. You know what? I got to talk to the, to the executive. I'm, I'm displaying plants with no flowers. What do I do? And that's okay. And it, uh, society has now gotten used to it and uh, it's totally acceptable. And I'm encouraging everybody to, uh, to look at this plant as a plant unto itself. And now that you know a little bit about it, I mean, look at that stunning uh, specimen of a bean and this colored bean is probably worth a fortune. And then the colors on this plant and just the way they're presented. And this is a good, a good time to look at judging because there is no, there is no judging handbook in Japan. It's the present, it's, it's what people bring in at that day and the way it's presented, the pot it's put in, even where you put the tag, the tag has to be in the front by the leg. And you can look at each one of these specimens. New Phoenicians don't grow this way. Somebody's taken their time to pot it this way, to cull it, to grow it for years, and to, to, to make it look like that. Sometimes a plant will be really huge. And so, you repot it and you'll have to divide it, take off a piece of it and give it a bit of a shape. But this is a, this is a nice um, uh, judging display. Um, so judging Japanese style, you don't have to run over a flower and make it flat and round. <laughs> um, so again, we talked about that already. And I just wanna show you a, a really famous, um, plant. Uh, this one is called Maizuru. They say it's priceless. And again, like the previous plant we looked at, um, this plant is really old. It's probably about four or five inches tall. It's a kind of plant where it seldom loses bottom leaves. So, I mean, I have a plant, one growth the size of this, and in a year, maybe it had one or two leaves. <laughs> so just to give you an idea, why this plant is priceless and the babies for sure have been culled to make it look like that. There's just, it reminds me of that uh, picture the Hubble telescope took of the, uh, the pillars of creation, right? <laughs> and then this is Nishi de Miyako, a very affordable plant, very well presented, and it does a lot of mutating. Um, but we'll look at that in a second. And here's some visually appealing plants, beautiful pot, beautiful kokodama style, like we had mentioned at the very beginning. And then these, it's like a little colony. I find, like I said, Neil's produced little colonies. This one has little colonies of, and very beautifully presented. And that's what they're gonna look at. Um, I, I don't think they're gonna look at the size of the flower and that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's the presentation as a whole. And like I said, there, there, there is no handbook. It's how, it's how, and how it looks to you. It's, it's kind of a special way, I think. Uh, it's a different way of judging. It's, it's, it's got its purpose uh, compared to other types of judging. I'm not gonna say one is better than the other, but to me, the way I grow plants, and I, I often when I buy even cut layers and things, I, I, choose, I choose the plant for the leaves. Um, often that could lead to the cool flower too. Um, Presentation again, different ways of presenting it. This is all the same. These two are the same variety, the right, right on the left. And uh, by the way, when you have roots coming out, I, I constantly get phone calls. What do I do about the roots? That's what it wants to do, especially Tamakongo. Tamakongo loves to send out roots. Uh, here's a smaller specimen. And then here's somebody growing it uh, beautifully in a totally different way on just a uh, cork lawn. This is a fellow I met in Japan, an older gentleman who claims to do the potting for the Imperial collection at the palace. Um, I can show you him if we have time, there's a five minute video, but it's up to you. Uh, and he did his present his um, uh, display in the, in the islands of Japan. 
this is my very first, uh, just to show you something, uh, my very first uh, display in Toronto. Uh, I couldn't find anything Japanese in Toronto, so we did Canadian wood and I found some Japanese paper and I was really proud of this display. This was, I think, in Toronto. Um, this is a display I got on AOS in the Cape Cod Society, Cape and Islands in Cape Cod. Uh, it was discussing the Fukurin patterns on Neo-Phoenicias. And again, the, it, notice the, the pots that were chosen for each plant. Um, judging, this isn't judging, this is ranking. So all, um, when, when a Neo-Phoenicia becomes registered, a registered variety, and a lot of the varieties that we saw, um, just because they're not registered doesn't mean they're not valuable or anything like that um, i believe it's because the registered varieties are stable varieties and so this is the chart this is the number one plant and what they do is this is the number one plant that's been number one for over 100 years and these are the really desirable ones in these big columns and these are the really expensive varieties that are rare and highly appreciated. And my friend gave me this title, only, only Oprah can afford. Um, and then they go down into the, uh, so each one of these squares is a variety. And then on the left um, are the three varieties that will make it into the chart next year. And it becomes a Fukiran. And they call Fukiran the orchid of the rich and noble. And what is number one? Right there, if we can have a drum roll. A, 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 a really good Fuki then, the prices have come down a bit, but they can run you about $600. And it hasn't changed in, in, in over a hundred years. And it's the very first plant that I showed you. And there it is. And you say, well, it looks like all the rest. It's very interesting, the one I owned, um, it's just a very fleshy plant and it's, it's very striking when you look at it, just the quality of the variegation. After five years, I looked at my plant one day and suddenly the green had become so intense. It takes a while for this one to do its thing. Um, so this would be a very expensive plant because there's several growths. And since 1860, it's been on number one and it hasn't left that number one spot. All the other, uh, all the other, squares they move around um, as the plants become more or less desirable. Now where is this hobby going to go? So you can buy Nishidimi Yako. It's a very fairly common variety. It mutates highly. Uh, some people buy it for that reason. It may not mutate but it often does and into more expensive varieties called, and slower growing varieties and higher end varieties like this one is called Manazuru. And Ishidimayako itself, not all meals do this, has created all these different um, varieties. The most common ones you see are Ginsekai and Manazuru. Uh, I think the rest would be quite expensive. This is such a lovely variegation in the center. Uh, this is Hana Mitsuki. It's about $10,000. Um, and it evolved from a common variety called Hana Goromo, which you can buy for about 35 bucks. And there it is on the Oprah category on the top. I happened to see one in Tokyo in a department store. I was really happy to, to see it in person. But these are not hard to grow. They're a perfect windowsill plant. Um, most people just grow them uh, in a condo like normal plants and they're successful. But to mimic Japan, uh, it's cold in the winter time, less watering. And honestly, the yeah, any window is going to do okay, preferably south or west. Um, you can do east if you have a couple of hours of sun. But honestly, when you water it, sometimes they're bone dry on the top. You put your finger into the moss, it's sometimes soggy. And that overwatering is what kills them. This is one of the growing areas, so you can see how cold it can get. Um, I've been told by a judge in Japan, minus, what's minus 10 Celsius? 
Um, that minus 10 for an hour Celsius is what they can handle. Um, I bought one. Okay, we talked about that. It died because of overwatering. I can't grow nails. I'm tired of hearing that. How many people uh, call me? They can't rebloom their phalaenopsis. They are great for beginners. Um, it's a great windowsill plant. This is a condo in Toronto. This is somebody growing under a tree. I think this is probably in Michigan, this picture. Uh, this is another condo in Toronto. Uh, this is my the way I grow them. Um, just one by one cedar slats. And if you buy it, make sure you buy a, a plastic pot. They're Japanese pots. They have a hole in the bottom and you can check for the water to see if you're watering it correctly. This is another view of my growing room and you can see how it's just, they nicely sit on the one by one cedar slats. And there's Orihime, the striped one we saw earlier. Uh, somebody in Michigan, they drove to Toronto to buy a very hard to find plant. And then they sent me a picture of how they grow them. And she likes to hang her plants, okay. Um, watering, this person waters with RO water just under the sink. Uh, what plants, if you're a beginner, Gojo Fukunin is a fantastic one, easy to grow. I'm growing this in full Western sun, no burning and it blooms. Uh, bean varieties to own, we talked about Tamakongo, Shiro Congo, Rakusui, uh, you should be able to get anything, especially in California, there's a lot of selection, I think, uh, in the $30 range. Uh, there's a Tama Congo there. We, we had talked about this. Flowers for beginners are Shuteno on the left and Hisui, very easily priced, and these make great specimens. Um, I'll just show you a grower and a few neos before we end this talk. This is the actual shot from the train heading to uh, the grower. And this is a wholesale grower in a small town south of Tokyo. Um, there's compost of little bean, um, bean varieties. I think that's called Benimuso. Uh, more compost. Um, this this one here is called Benkei Maru. It's one of my top five favorite. This was in his greenhouse. This is not a problem. This is part of the charm, the brownness in the leaves. And it's such a bent looking variety. Um, and I think it's by division only, but they're, they're really uh, my cup of tea. This is one of us displays in the greenhouse. And the thing about this house, it's only 16 inches wide. So you see these miniature, miniature uh, neos in these miniature pots, beautifully displayed. And it's all about presentation. Uh, this one, I have no idea what it is, but it was one and a half million yen. Uh, you may know Glenn Lair. He was one of the pioneers in the US selling neos. And that's the grower there. And he had a cigarette in his mouth the entire time. I think I was told he had 60 cigarettes a day. So, uh, plants that I like. Um, now that you know everything about Neophonetias, but since we don't have you in person to talk, what is unusual about this plant? It is a tiny plant, it is a bean plant. It has ruby roots, it has tiger striping. We're talking about $300 for a single piece but very, very, and look at the presentation. Again, it's like a little colony. Benny Musso. Now I'm just gonna let you enjoy um, just a few, a few slides before we end about the different types. This one here, out of 100,000 plants, this evolved and the first plants cost thousands of dollars. It's just the striping on the beans. Sukaiden is very, very easy to obtain. Green only in the 
first few days. That's Toronto on the background. Stunning to me because of the way um, the leaves just go in all directions. Kudo Shinjo we looked at, tiny, tiny plant the size of a nickel. The minute beans get stripes, the price really goes up. This is about the size of a nickel. Our dream was, if there can be a I'm going to go back to this one. A friend of mine bought a $30 plant from Japan and it started growing like this. Oops. It started bending backwards and everybody wanted it and they were paying $400 for a piece. So a mutation happened. Yendonamatsu, very, very, very inexpensive. But again, you see a very inexpensive plant, but look what happens with the presentation. Getsuden, I love it because of the brown leaves. This one here, yes, is about Kimbo 10 will run you a thousand dollars of growth, but it's stunning and it's very difficult to grow. This one here, I, I, I just can't say enough. I just can't say enough about it. It looks like it's dying, but this is my kind of plant. There's nothing wrong with it. Sansa kind of my. <laughs> and this is the last plant I saw leaving the nursery in Japan. And this is the actual drive out of the nursery. And I thank you so much for your attention and inviting me to talk. And uh, I hope that um, if you haven't tried a nail, try it. And uh, I hope you can learn to treat it a little bit different than other types of orchids and appreciate it for the entire plant. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, while people are coming off mute to uh, ask questions or on the chat, whatever they want, um, I do think, I mean, you did great timing. Uh, if you want to present, do people want to hear the, the, the five minute video? It's worth it. Yeah, why don't sure. we do that and think of your sure. questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, what, what I'm going to do is um, it's a short video. Um, he speaks only Japanese, and he's he's gonna he's gonna pot it in traditional Japanese style. I'm, I have two videos, but for the sake of time, what he did was he he shows you the traditional way. Then the other one, he goes, if you don't want to do this, then don't do it. Then he takes the roots, he starts slavering moss onto it, ties it up, and he goes, here it looks the same, right? So, the point is, don't get too hung up on potting. Uh, just make the plant look nice. So I'm going to go ahead with, um, I'm asking, I, I don't have the right to, to, this is my video, it was taken by somebody I know, and I don't want it to be recorded if that's okay. Okay, let me turn off the recording. Hold on. Uh...